I'll, I'll try and speak louder. How's that, Charles? You're way back there. I can't hear very well either. <laughs> so I'd like to thank you all for being here today. I'd like to say a special thanks to everyone who's a guest here today. And, and it's, it's an exciting time. And God loves us. He loves us for sure. Um, we, uh, we have a plan. Uh, you're going to have to listen to me for, from now on, you know. No. <laughs> no, that's not the plan. What a plan. Thank God. <laughs> so we do have a plan. Uh, a, a number of us are going to rotate through the book of Galatians. Uh, I'm going to start out with an introduction. Reggie's going to follow me. Kevin's going to follow him, and, and Frosty's going to uh, follow him. And hopefully, sooner or later, we'll get another pastor here, and we'll just try and keep that, that rotation going. But with that said, uh, we're going to have a meeting, uh, our second hour. Uh, all the members need to be here. Uh, we're going to vote. We're going to vote on Austin as to whether or not he will be our next pastor. And I also welcome any visitors or someone who isn't, uh, isn't uh, a member of the church. This is, this is something that the, the members have to, to vote for. And, 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 but you're welcome to stay and see how the whole process is and how the, how the outcome is. So I encourage anyone who's not a member here to stay and, uh, and listen to how that all goes. In the meantime... I'm going to start us off with an introduction to the book of Galatians, and, and it's a, kind of a lengthy thing. I hope I have enough time here, and, and if not, I've already told Ken to eliminate some pages because I, I got carried away with some of this, and, and we may have to cut it short too, but um, as it is, I will start out with our book introduction to the book of Galatians. Galatian derives from the title pro uh, It's from a region in uh, Asia Minor, uh, it's the, which we would call modern Turkey today. Paul was the author of, of the book of Galatians. There's no reason to question that. Uh, he wrote Galatians and, and Paul was born in a city called Tarsus and that, that province is in Cilicia and not far from Galatia. So he was familiar with the area. Um, he, he learned a lot of the Old Testament um, teachings that, that were going about from an individual called Gamaliel. Um, he received that training in the Old Testament scriptures um, and in the Rabbinic, however you say that, uh, traditions at Jerusalem. Uh, he was a member of the ultra-Orthodox sect of the Pharisees, and uh, he was one of the first century Judaism's rising stars, as that, that goes. That was up and, and until uh, the course of Paul's life changed dramatically. He was on his way to Damascus uh, from Jerusalem to persecute Christians. That's what his goal was, it was to persecute Christians. He was confronted by the risen and glorified Jesus Christ. And that dramatic encounter turned Paul from Christianity's chief persecutor to one of his greatest missionaries. His three missionary journeys and trip to Rome turned Christianity from a faith that included only a small group of Palestinian um, Jewish believers into an empire worldwide phenomenon. Galatians is one of 13 inspired books or letters from Paul, and, and it was all addressed to the Gentile congregations or his fellow workers. Most likely these first uh, epistles dating back, or this was the, his first epistle dating back to either 48 or 49 AD. There are two options, really, in Paul's day that uh, it could have been. And many, many theologians somewhat disagree, but I think for the most part, most of them agree, agree on what section it was. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. It has two 
distinct meanings, uh, Galatia does. And, and the first one is kind of in an ethnic sense. Um, Galatia was a region, that region was in Asia Minor, inhabited by the Galatian. Uh, they were a Celtic people who had migrated to that region from Gaul, or what we would call France today. Um, in the third century BC, uh, the Romans conquered Galatians in 189 BC, and when Galatia became a Roman province, uh, incorporating some regions not inhabited by the ethnic Galatians, these parts were like Lyc Lyconia, Phrygia, and Poseidia. And in a political sense, uh, Galatia came to describe the entire province, not merely the region inhabited by the ethnic Galatians, but also Paul founded churches in what is called the southern part of Galatia. And this is where I think most theologians believe that Paul wrote these, this, this first letter to. These were the cities of Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. These are all established in, in the book Acts. This is why I think most believe that this is, this is where this, this letter was attributed to. And although these were um, a province in, in Roman, Roman area of Galatia, uh, these were not the ethnic Galatians. Uh, there was no record of Paul's founding churches in that northern section, so it's, and, and even though it is a less populated area. And because neither Acts nor Galatia, or Galatians mentions any of these cities or people from the northern Galatia, it is reasonable to believe that Paul addressed the epistle to the churches located in the southern part. Um, Acts does record the apostles' foundings of such churches, churches in Poseidon, Antioch, and Iconium, and Lystra, and Derbe. And in addition to the churches Paul addressed had apparently been established before the Jerusalem Council. And this is another one of those things that helped them to decide whether or not this was a earlier book or a later book, and, and this kind of uh, is the foundation for that timing on that. So what it, it actually makes that letter one of his, well, his very first letter to, uh, to the churches. The central theme of Galatians, like that of Romans, Paul defends his position as an apostle uh, in chapters 1 and 2. We find that uh, that there are real, really three main themes, and 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 then he defends the doctrine, which is the salvation by grace alone, nothing more and nothing less. That's in chapters three and four, and the practical implications of the Christian walk in His grace and not in the law, which we find in chapters five and six. And as we go through these, we will get a lot more details as to what all of this stuff is. And like I say, I'm kind of coming at this from a 30,000 foot view. We're kind of covering some basic stuff. And, and uh, we'll let some of these other guys share in some of the details on this. The book of Galatians has been called the Magna Carta of spiritual freedom. It has been called the Christian's Declaration of Independence. And it has been identified as the battle cry of the Reformation, which liberated the gospel from Roman Catholicism and gave birth to Protestantism, as what we now know it. Of course, a key figure in the Reformation, <coughs> and if we look a little further into our history, our more recent history, say 500 years ago, when the Reformation actually happened, there was a man called Martin Luther, uh, who was a Catholic monk at that time. When he came to study the book of Galatians, discovered the true gospel, the gospel of salvation, and by grace and faith, he says, he says, and this is a quote from Martin Luther, the epistle to Galatians is my epistle. He says, to it, I am as though I were married. 
Galatians is my Catherine. And if you recall his history, you will know and note he was married to a woman <coughs> named Catherine von Bora, whom he called Katie. And he said, spiritually speaking, Galatians is my Catherine. Luther's commentary and his teachings on Galatians came out with his salvation. His salvation experience. He was saved while he was teaching the book of Galatians, along with that of Romans. So it was a very important book in his life. It became to be known as the Manifesto of the Protestant Reformation. The message of the book of Galatians, then of course, as well as the book of Romans. Galatians deals with important issues. Law, grace, works, the gospel, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and our Lord's death, his resurrection, salvation, and sanctification. We're talking about a book that's only six chapters long, and I'm telling you, it's filled with this stuff. <coughs> These are gospel-related realities, and they're all part and in part by, in the book of Galatians. But the primary message, the primary message of the book of Galatians is freedom. Freedom from sin, freedom from judgment, freedom from hell, freedom from all forms of spiritual bondage, and liberation into the glorious purposes of the grace of God. About 20 times in this short epistle of six chapters, we will come across some form of the word bondage or freedom. It is a book about spiritual freedom, and it seems so re relevant. People who are not in Christ, although they think they are free, are all deceived. There is no freedom to the unregenerate soul. Because that soul is bound to sin. The only freedom they have is the freedom to choose which sin they choose to follow. There's no freedom from that sin. There's, for there's no freedom from their guilt. There's no freedom from their fear. It is all a lie. It is deception of our time, and people are really not free if they're not following Jesus Christ. They are bound in the chains of transgression and iniqu iniquity and headed for a sentence from God that will assign them to eternal punishment. They're not free. Jesus said in verse 8, verse 32, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. He's talking about the gospel truth. The truth of the word of God. That is the only thing that sets you free, and because it alone frees you from the bondage of sin, and consequently guilt and judgment and death and eternal hell, the message of Galatians is the message of freedom. True freedom. For some people, it's kind of a spiritual thing. Where you can believe that this kind of moral self-denial will bring you to true freedom. So you just join a monastery, or you maybe uh, had it bad enough, or your lusts aren't controlled enough, and you inflict wounds on your body. We've heard of all kinds of things that people do. Maybe you go in public and you just kind of close your eyes and you say, I don't, I don't see that. <coughs> maybe that's the approach that some people take. Maybe you have kind of a, a morality that's sort of generally acceptable, and you think, that's okay. <clears throat> For other people, freedom comes in self-reliance. Freedom comes in being disconnected from anybody else, or anybody else's expectations. 
or perhaps maybe somebody else's intrusions. For some people, freedom is just kind of a morality. For other people, freedom is like an amorality. The philosophy of the last 50 years, just be you. Just be you. This is not freedom. How do you free yourself from you? Or who you are? Your problem is not outside of you, it's inside of you. It's aided and abetted by those who are around you and the culture that defines corruption and standardizes it and makes it seem as if it is the norm. But we are the problem. And we will never be free until you are a different you. And the only thing that will do that, Paul says, in Galatians, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is nothing in the world that can free you from you but the gospel. So where does freedom lie? Right here in chapter 5. Chapter 5, Galatians. Galatians chapter 5 said, It is for freedom that Christ set us free. There, in a sense, is the summation of the book of Galatians. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. When, when a person comes to Christ, he or she comes to the liberator. He is the liberator who sets us free. The prison door is finally open and true freedom is found. And we will never again be incarcerated. We are forever free from the power, the penalty, and one day, the presence of sin. The Christian gospel is that everybody sins. Everybody breaks the law. Every human being who has ever lived except Christ himself, the person of Christ, and therefore we're all under divine judgment, we're all cursed by God, we're all on our way to the eternal hell. However, God is not only a judge, He's also gracious. And He is willing to forgive and eager to forgive so that we are told that we can escape these consequences <coughs> of this sin by putting our trust in our Lord Jesus Christ. He took our place. And He bore the punishment that we should, should have received. That's the Christian gospel. That those who believe in Christ have their sins covered because Christ paid in full the penalty for their sins to the extent that justice of God was sanctified, satisfied. I'm sorry. The reason there was a Reformation some 500 years ago, Luther penned his 95 theses on the door of the church in Wittenberg, Germany. And the reason there was a reformation from Catholicism was because the Roman Catholic Church had been teaching that salvation was a combination of faith plus works. Faith plus works. And the reformers understood the Bible to stay to say that just the the just shall live by faith alone. It is by grace and not according to works. And that was the reason there was a Protestant Reformation. It is just a form of the word protest. The protest was against the false doctrine of salvation, which brought faith and works together, and therefore canceled out the true gospel of faith alone. By faith. By faith. Hebrews 11, verse 17 says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up his, his son Isaac. And he who had received the promise was offered up his only begotten son. It was he whom he had said, And Isaac, your descendants, shall all be called. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead 
and he was willing to sacrifice his son because he knew God would raise him from the dead. Sounds like a familiar story, don't it? From the New Testament. The covenant promises of Abraham find their summit in the resurrection. The covenant threats of Moses find their summit in the crucifixion. So the law is simply an addition. Faith is emphasized in Abraham and repentance is emphasized in Moses. When you come to the Gospels, what do you hear John the Baptist saying? Repent and believe. Repent and believe. You must recognize that you're under a curse of the Mosaic Law and come to faith in Jesus Christ to receive the blessing of the Abrahamic promises. The law is an insertion for a period of time pointing to Christ. In Matthew 5, he said, I did not come to break the law. I did not come to set aside the law. I came to fulfill the law. Until it is all fulfilled, I must fulfill all righteousness. And he came and he lived the law perfectly. Something which we cannot do. That's why also Romans 10 says, Christ is the end of the law. So what role does the law have? Well, first of all, it was ceremonial law. No role. Really, no role at all for us. Well, how about the ceremonial priesthood? No role. Not only is Christ our high priest, but he is our kingdom of priests. We are. There is a new covenant in his blood. He's a new king. He's our great high priest. So what's the law's purpose? <coughs> Moving from ceremonial law, they have no purpose. Sacrificial law, they have no pur purpose. So how do we know that the sacrificial law should have ended? Because our Lord, at the time of his death, tore in half the veil of the temple from top to bottom. Allowing us all to have access to God. Ripped it apart. So what's the purpose of the law now? It was a hedge separating Israel from the nations around them. It was a bridle restraining their sin. It was a barrier preventing them from walking across the lines into transgression. It was a mirror. All of these things were biblical images of what the law was. But the primary purpose, the primary purpose of what, what the law really was, its chief task was to show the other utter sinfulness of man, his desperate need for a redeemer, and to point them to Christ. Point us all to Christ. We're sinful, and we need to have Christ in our life. The law is a tutor. It teaches us that we're sinful. It teaches us that we are disobedient, lawless transgressors. And it teaches us that we are cursed. It makes us aware of our profound guilt, and it literally kills us. I read in Romans chapter 7, When I saw the law, I thought I was alive prior to seeing the true law of God. And when I saw it for what it really was, the true moral law of God, it killed me. I died. The law produce, produces guilt. But there is one other law remaining and that is the moral law and the moral law is a reflection of the characters of God so now as a believer all that's left for me is the moral law so what should be my relations my relationship with that a simple answer is are there any commandments in the New Testament that we should follow. 
Short answer is yes, there are. So what are the new commandments in the New Testament? What should we do? What we ought to do? Or maybe not ought to do not. <laughs> Does God want you to obey Him? Yes. What is a Christian believer's relationship to the law now? It is a instruction to holiness. Sanctification is a relationship to God. It is not a relationship to the law. I can't be saved by keeping the law, and I will not be sanctified by ignoring the law. If I love God, I love Him for His grace, and I love Him for His holiness. Legalism is banished when we see the truth about God's grace and we enjoy Him for it because we love God. We love His grace and we love Him for His holiness. Paul's been talking about to the Galatian believers and to all of us now that you are in Christ, the Holy Spirit is in you. And you are led by the Holy Spirit. If you walk in the Spirit, you will realize the fruit of the Spirit. We all recognize them. It's in Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. If you walk in the Spirit, that is what you will experience. That is just exactly what you will experience. Love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness. On the other hand, just a little further back, in verse 19 of that very fifth same chapter, the opposite of that. You plant deeds of the flesh, you will harvest immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, actions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. This is just a short list. This is just a short list of the things that we can do if we're not following the Spirit. Paul's talking to us about how to live a Christian life. In the first two chapters, he defended his apostleship as one who represented the Lord Jesus Christ. We talk like we haven't even got there yet, but that's what he's going to talk about. In the second two chapters, he talks about, in chapters 3 and 4, he, he defends the gospel of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, apart from works. Just a summation. And he goes into much, much detail. And then in the final two chapters, he's telling us... <coughs> In 5 and 6, he's telling us how to live a Christian life. This all comes at a reason. It all comes at a reason. People need to understand why he was talking to the Galatians about this. He had just planted these churches. And there's a reason that it comes about that he needs to do this. So he wants to warn everyone that whatever you plant is exactly what you harvest. It's kind of an important warning. And as he goes on, he talks about being deceived. Do not be deceived. Self-deceit is a problem for everybody. For all of us. It tends to be that kind of deception that runs typically like this. You're saved. You're saved. You're on the way to heaven. That can't happen. You're under grace. The Lord will never let you go. So there can't really be too serious of consequences if I walk in the flesh. 
it turns into kind of a license, a self-deception. You can add to that fact that there is a deceiver in the world. In Revelation 20, it says this. It says, Satan is a deceiver who deceives the whole world and who deceives the nations. And how about 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10? Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, or drunkards, nor rivalers, or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some as you, but you were washed. Don't be deceived about who's a true believer. We can all be deceived. You can be deceived by choosing your friends. Bad ones. Listen to 1 Corinthians. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Don't kid yourself. If you have someone that's a friend or a close associate or something like that, they can be a bad influence. Don't be deceived about your church. Listen to Romans 16, verses 17. Maybe further. I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who come with dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you have learned and turn away from them. This is what the Galatian church was dealing with back then. False teachers. People that were coming into the church trying to teach stuff. It was different from what Paul was teaching them. He was warning them. He was warning us. There can be false teachers. There can be troublemakers. There can be people causing dissension. They can create all kinds of havoc in the church. They can tear up unity. That's what we're called to be, the body of Christ, one. And yet they can break that apart. Don't be deceived by false teachers. Ephesians 4 says, Children, don't be tossed to and fro and be carried about by every wind of doctrine by those who come to deceive you. And in 2 Timothy it says, deceivers will get worse and worse. You have a choice as a believer. You can walk in the Spirit. You can walk in the flesh. Don't think for a moment that you can walk in the flesh and not pay the consequences. There are consequences. You can mock, you cannot mock God and get away with it. This is essential throughout this entire scripture. If we went and looked at Nebuchadnezzar, <laughs> he mocked God and it didn't turn out well for him. Kind of went crawling around like an animal eating grass. In Romans chapter 1, there was the wrath of God revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. They turned from the creator to the creature. And Roman 1 describes a mockery of God. And the wrath of God is released on men when they mock God. And the wrath of Romans is the wrath of turning them over to their sin and to uh, immorality and homosexuality and, and the reprobate, reprobate mind. The harvest is determined by the planting. The planting. Planting season in Iowa right now. They're getting a lot of crops in. Getting the job done. And like begets like. You don't plant corn and expect soybeans. You don't plant strawberries and get wheat. You know, you plant what you get. About a child, we had them all lined up here earlier. Think about a child, foolishly, foolishly indulged and encouraged to think only of his own whims, his own selfish desires. Well, just do it your way. It'll be all right. It may be cute when they're little, 
But when they're grown, they become obstinate, stubborn, sullen, self-centered, undisciplined adults who reap a whirlwind. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he gets old, he's not going to depart from it. This is an incredible law that works in our lives. Get close. It is the heart of our testimony to sow righteousness, to sow the Spirit, to sow good deeds. And he closes in verse 10. To those who are in the household of faith, of the faith, the Christian faith, especially believers, especially fellow believers, we should do nothing but good to one another. Nothing. Nothing but good. In Ephesians 2.19, you are no longer strangers and aliens, you're fellow citizens and saints, and you are God's household. <coughs> you're part of his family, from whom every family in heaven and earth derives its name. You're God's family. You need to show your good family. You need to show it to others. So the call was clear. There's a law operating in the world. It's called the moral law. It's God's moral law. It's a law operating in the world that you can't, and you can't get around it. You can't avoid it. It works. The whole universe is built on laws, physical and moral. God's moral law is summed up this way. Galatians 5, 22, one more time. Walk in the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and against such thing there is no law. Amen. Amen. We are going to close with that. Like I said, mentioned earlier, I've got a number of guys that's going to help me do this. I thank them very much because I don't want to do this by myself. <laughs> and, and we can do this together. Uh, we are going to take a short break. I am a little hesitant to do that, but I want to take a short break. And, and what we'll do is we'll gather right back in here, and we've got a single agenda item to vote for Austin Ankrum as our new pastor. If you haven't met Austin, he's been here. If you have, you know what he's like. Um, we'll talk about that a little more uh, when we get back in here. So I encourage you to, as, as members, please come back in here and we'll get that meeting started. And uh, thank you all, and let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for our time here together. I thank you for all that you've done in this church. I thank you for Jeff and Wynn, who spent uh, a large portion, 11, 12 years of time here, building this church, helping us to establish this place. And we thank you so much for that being a part of our, our lives here in Mediapolis. We, we wish them well in their new, their new chapter in their lives. But then we also thank you for not leaving us stranded. We have the opportunity. We have the responsibility to uh, vote and to find as a new pastor that will lead us into the next chapter. And I believe, along with many other people, many other people believe that Austin is the right person for this job. So, Father, it doesn't really matter what we believe. We are asking your will and, and to help us make this decision. So we just ask for your guidance and your, 
decisions to help us allow that spirit to speak to our hearts and to just do what we're called to do. As we think going forward, we thank you for all your goodness in our lives. We thank you that you have done what was necessary for us so that we can come to you and not have a hindrance at all. That veil has been split. We can come directly to you and you can speak to us through your spirit. And we just thank you for that as well. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Amen.